Well, evening all, and uh, welcome to our live question and answer session with the chairman, Dave Cormack. Um, should say at this point that Dave um, has had a look at the questions in advance uh, for the reason of being able to give you the most uh, detailed answer that he can. The hour is going to fly by, I'm sure about that, uh, and we'll try and squeeze in as many of your questions as possible. And uh, Dave, you are live from your boy's basement in Atlanta, is that accurate? Yeah, I'm at uh, my son and daughter-in-law's basement in Atlanta, and um, we've got this um, rustic carving behind us, or he has, of, of the club, which is a great backdrop as well. But uh, it's been a while, Rob. It's uh, good to see you. And good to see you as well. And, and just to prove that this is completely live, uh, Dave, you and I are both panicking at the moment about Scotland against the Pharaohs, aren't we? Gosh, um, I think we always panic whenever Scotland plays. You know, we were pretty spoiled in the 70s and 80s getting to those, uh, all those World Cups, you know. And so hopefully, you know, Andy gets a, a start tonight. But um, again, it was... Um, Good to see as well that uh, Miko Vertonen signed an extended contract with the club today as well. So delighted about that. Yeah, that's good news. And we're about an hour and 45 minutes away from kickoff at Hamden. Uh, let's crack on then because we've got a lot to cram in in the next while. Thanks for all your questions. Um, Dave, you've, you've been chairman for 15 months now, uh, a pandemic, a significant collapse of, of income. First question is from Ryan Chute. Uh, what's the one thing you're most proud of uh, during your tenure so far? One thing you might have changed and what would success look like for you over the next five years? Well, Ryan, it's, uh, it's uh, a great question. In fact, we've got tremendous questions here and it's uh, given me a sleepless night just preparing for it. But uh, here we go. Um, well, first of all, you have to have a clear strategy on and off the field. And we set that strategy clearly out in May of 2019 on and off, as I say, on and off the field. Uh, that I believe a, has helped us enormously to navigate through this pandemic. I'm really proud of how the club, fans and community rallied together. Uh, best example of that maybe is the hashtag still standing free campaign demonstrated that we are a family club, club that really cares about our community. Um, what would I have changed um, if I had a crystal ball, the pandemic, but I don't have a crystal ball. Um, the one thing that comes to mind, I guess, recently is the, um, uh, the setting up of the, this question and answer uh, a number of weeks ago and then having to postpone it. Um, that, was, um, that was my fault. Um, I should have thought before we committed to doing it about um, giving the necessary time um, to the team um, to to get on um, with the games, but uh, look, uh, none of us are perfect. But judge us on how we respond, and that's why we're here uh, tonight. Um, success to me. Everything we're doing in our strategy is geared towards making fans want to come to watch the team. Ultimately, it's about winning. Winning a trophy must be a goal. Two would be even better. Good answer. Um... A lot of the questions, uh, not surprisingly, uh, center on uh, the new manager, the new appointment. Emma Forbes uh, and many others are asking about the recruitment process, the applicants, how many interviews were held, and how did you end up choosing Stephen Glass? Well, I know it's a, it's a question for everyone, and Emma, it's a, it's a super question. Uh, so first of all, let's talk about the process and then why Stephen? Um, we filtered through a long list of candidates and we've approached a few ourselves. Uh, we interviewed eight candidates, mostly all of who were what I would call um, an emerging talent fit. There were four outstanding candidates and ultimately Stephen was chosen by the board as the coach we wanted to manage Aberdeen. So why Stephen? Um, well, um, he's an absolute passion for the role. He's invested in the DNA of the club, having uh, grown up um, as a young boy at the club and having a fantastic career. Uh, his approach to the game, he shares the club vision for high energy, attacking, dynamic and pressing play. Um, 
He's invested in the club's strategy on youth player development, club partnerships, and our identified squad profile for us to build real value in the squad. Um, at Atlanta, uh, when he took over from Ronald DeBoer, when he was let go, he demonstrated positive leadership through adversity uh, during that time. Um, they had hardly any of their designated players available. They had some challenges, a mix of, you know, um, Hispanic players as well as European and um, US players. And throughout that, Stephen had a positive influence on these high profile players. And um, he's a real motivator. Uh, when we kind of look at guys like Miro uh, and Jack McKenzie coming through, Calvin Ramsey and others, um, Stephen in Atlanta, like many other top coaches, started out with uh, an under 17 professional team. He rapidly moved to Atlanta United too, who play in the USL league just below MLS. It is a real challenging league, as competitive as a championship in Scotland. The difference is that Stephen, uh, his goal was to develop players. It wasn't necessarily about winning. Best example we can give there on the youth side is George Bellow from under 17s to the Atlanta two team. And when Stephen took over, um, the as interim coach of Atlanta United, the MLS team, he moved George Bellow up. George played almost every game, and he's now a U.S. international. Um, top class players want to play for him, including guys like St Scott Brown. And um, although I'm sure Stephen wouldn't thank me for this, he's 44 years old. He's no spring chicken. He's been coaching for a number of years, and as I said, he's paid his dues from youth professional teams uh, to MLS. Dave, so, some fans are saying that the Stephen Glass appointment and Scott Brown's signing were already done deals uh, before even the, the interview process began. Gregor Reed is keen to know how certain people uh, seem to know that it would be Stephen Glass and Scott Brown before even applications had arrived. He says it suggests the decision had already been made and the process was a sham. Yeah, so um, let's talk um, after the Red Team interview about the process and why it sped up. There were four manager positions became vacant, uh, one after the other in England at the, right at that time. And we knew a number of the candidates were applying for these roles too. Of the eight we shortlisted, four, uh, of the eight, we shortlisted four within two days of the Red TV interview, where I said, it will take what it takes. After two hour in-depth interviews with all four, we reduced it to two candidates. And of the final two at the end of that week, Stephen had the better overall credentials. Every candidate was asked who they would bring in. So the reason the Scott decision happened fairly quickly was that we knew that Stephen wanted to bring Scott in and we knew Celtic were trying extremely hard to keep him. So Scott was part of the team that Stephen believed would come to Aberdeen. The board met on Monday night and we unanimously agreed on Stephen as the new manager. He was never offered the job until I called him. And those who know me know I'm competitive and I'll always choose the best person for the job. After Stephen was um, found out that night, we immediately set about getting Scott. A Celtic did everything to keep him right up until uh, the hour he signed his contract. So um, that's the, the process we went through. That's what happened and that's why it was sped up. And we believe we have the right manager for Aberdeen. I'm just going to add in my own question here, Dave. When, when will Stephen be in position? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, it looks like right now, because of the quarantine, and he has to quarantine for 10 days, 11 nights, it looks like he will obviously miss the game against Dumbarton. And it looks like um, he'll miss the St. Johnson game, but he'll be hopefully um, there at the beginning of that week. Um, Scott Brown was signed just a few days after Stephen was appointed. Stephen Bell, uh, with the next question, doesn't think he's the only person feeling uncomfortable with the signing. He says this is, of course, only due to the to his very public support of his then teammate Alexander Tonev, who racially abused our own Shay Logan. Uh, to me, he says Brown's recruitment is not a good look for our club, and certainly not the Aberdeen way, a phrase which has been used a lot over 
the last week. Have the board and manager uh, given any thought to this during the hiring process? Well, of course, um, it's important that you get the right person with the right values. Um, so let's talk about the incident with Tonev. Tonev was found guilty of abusing Shea and he was rightly punished. We as a club stood up for Shea. The only time Shea thinks about it is when others bring it up. There's no issue between Shea and Scott, both are tough competitors on the field. Rightly or wrongly, players invariably support what their teammates say to them. That does not make them guilty of the crime their teammate is then punished for. In Scott's case, we all saw, we all saw Scott um, just on, on the spur of the moment go over to Glenn Kamara and show solidarity with him when they played Rangers. Scott has led players of all backgrounds for the best part of 15 years. He is totally different off the field to his on the field character, as many people will know. The charitable work he does goes above and beyond. And as such, the board is convinced of Scott's character and credentials. Now, let me just talk about Shea for, for a moment or two, because he's gone out on loan. You know, with the manager moving to a back three at the beginning of this season, both Shea and more so Ronnie Hernandez got very little playing time. Paul Sheeran made the call before the Dundee United game that others were going to get game time ahead of Shea going forward for the rest of the season. Last Sunday night, just um, a few days ago, Hearts called us about taking Shea on loan. It's something that Shea wanted to do, and it's only five games. He'll be back at Aberdeen for the final few weeks of the season, at which point we can rightly thank him and show him our appreciation for his seven years of tremendous dedication and service to the club. That's the totality of it, Rob. Okay, Dave, we're, we're live with uh, your questions and Dave's answers. Next up, Ian Green, who's concerned about the apparent leaks of information which have surfaced, he says, in recent weeks in relation and is worried this is a change of tack from the club. Who is leaking this information, says Ian, and what do we plan to do about the leaked information? For a professional outfit like ourselves, we should be operating in a far more discreet manner than we've seen this last year. Well, I agree. It's absolutely frustrating. It's not a change in tact. And if it was only down to Aberdeen, I think the, the leaks by and large would disappear. But unfortunately, there are multiple parties involved, parties involved and not just Aberdeen. There are other clubs involved. There are agents involved. There are players and their families that know. Let's take the latest with Shui going out on loan. That was a Sunday night. It was reported early on Monday morning that he was going um, to Hearts. The paperwork did not get concluded until Monday evening. And so it's a frustration for us that information gets out there. And we typically are not gonna comment on a player's contractual situation till the paperwork was done. And within three minutes of that deal being signed on loan with Shea on Monday night, it was out from the club. But as I said, unfortunately, there are many other parties involved in this. And, um, and but, you know, we will continue to do our utmost from our side to make sure nothing is coming out of the club. OK, much has been speculated uh, about Ronnie Hernandez. Uh, Dave's mentioned him already, who's now gone on loan to Atlanta. Uh, questions from lots of fans, including Ross Walker, uh, who says, I'm interested to know the story behind the Ronnie Hernandez signing. Uh, he was the biggest signing the club has made in recent years, and we've hardly even heard his name, let alone seen him play. And I'm going to bracket with that question another one from Callum Shaw, who wants you to explain about the money that was used for the transfer. Who and where did this money come from? Does the club owe those who loaned the money anything when this deal goes through, uh, such a, as a repayment of the loan? If so, what's the figure, Dave? Whew, that's a hell of a question, Rob. <laughs> I won't make you repeat it. Um, so, Ronnie Hernandez, fantastic lad, fantastic player, great attitude. We were in the market for a right back round about just after the transfer window of 2020 in January. We were liaising with Atlanta, and we do liaise with Atlanta, where we, we look at each other's scouting systems, 
and it flagged Ronnie up as, as a right back. It fit the profile for us as a club of a young talent that we could develop and sell on after two to three years. Very much like how we looked at Lewis and Ross buying those guys from other teams. Ronnie had played 17 times for Venezuela in the Copa America against Brazil, Argentina. Um, the manager absolutely wanted the player. The board sanctioned the transfer fee. As I said, just like Lewis and Ross, who we paid 600,000 for, you know, who are not full international, we felt this was a good investment. Ronnie wanted to play in Europe at a top club. That was his goal. And, and I believe he still does. Of course, COVID arrived. And when the new season, sorry, of course, after COVID arrived, when the new season came, the team playing three at the back did not favor Ronnie and it didn't favor Shea either, as we said earlier. But let's be clear, Aberdeen FC bought the player and he's still our player today. When he was getting no playing time and he had been away from his wife and daughter for almost a year because they couldn't get a UK visa due to the impact of COVID, we made the decision to provide him compassionate leave and to help him find another club to get game time. It was me that approached Major League Soccer and Atlanta, because as most people will know with Major League Soccer, it's not the individual teams that own the player contracts. It has to go through MLS. It took weeks to make it happen, and no one else came in for uh, Ronnie. Fortunately, Gabriel Heinze, the new coach at Atlanta, liked him. So hopefully he earns the game time he needs to shine. Uh, he'll be there until the end of the MLS, MLS season. As I said kind of earlier, um, you can't look upon, um, you cannot look upon uh, these deals in isolation. You know, we sold Scott McKenna and Sam Cosgrove for significant fees. Ross and Lewis are proving to be good investments, as we said, and we're excited about the emerging homegrown talent that we have. Now, as far as um, uh, who paid for Ronnie, Aberdeen Football Club paid for Ronnie uh, in our financial accounts um, for um, last year. Um, it was noted that a loan came in um, not long after Ronnie was signed. Uh, that loan um, was um, subsequently, subsequently converted to stock, I think it was in October, and that loan came in from me and my family. So I put the money in, not just for Ronnie, I put a million in to help the club with some cash flow as well, because as you'll know, you know, when season tickets, uh, the season ticket money comes in, by the time you get round to March, it can be a bit of a challenge. So the bottom line is, is the money came in from me, I've converted uh, interest free, I converted that all to, um, to shares. Uh, so the club owes nobody anything for Ronnie. A detailed question and a, and a detailed answer as well. And, and as a follow-up question from David Forbes, David asks, are the Dons little more than a glorified feeder club for Atlanta? Absolutely not. And look, having gone through COVID, it really has hurt the partnership in terms of development players going both ways. Atlanta put two million into Aberdeen uh, to show their commitment to the partnership. Jack McKenzie would have played for Atlanta this season if it was not for COVID. He was planned to go over uh, last, I think it was August, to play with um, uh, Stephen Glass's team. John Gallagher, he came with no expectation, yet played over 30 games, I believe, for us. Atlanta paid his wages with no loan fee to us. And we got value out of John, and John has now moved on to uh, the new team in, in Austin. If there are players who can earn a position in the Aberdeen squad or vice versa, it makes sense to collaborate, to give these guys experience. We can offer experience to our players like Jack would have over in the States, and they can offer European experience to their players too. We think that's beneficial to uh, both sides. So let's say we get, for example, two players from Atlanta who Stephen Glass rates highly. And I'm not saying there are, I'm just using this as an example. Atlanta benefit from the players being developed and getting experience uh, over here. We benefit from our wages budget being able to stretch further. With COVID, this could make the difference for us being able to stretch for an experienced striker. But make no mistake, 
No player going between the clubs on collaboration will do so unless it benefits both sides. And of course, Stephen Glass is in the perfect position to judge and manage this. Dave, fans are looking for clarity on player contracts and loan signings. Uh, Gary Patterson asks, given the significant number of players uh, who will be out of contract or whose loan spell is up at the end of the season, uh, what inroads have been made to make new signings in plenty of time to join in at the start of pre-season training? Well, that's a great question. And um, you listen, I, I wish we all knew or had confirmation we'd be back to full fans at the beginning of the season. It's looking more hopeful than it did. But it's um, it's a really difficult question to answer. What I can say is this, and I want to go back a step here and then take us, take us to here. In the summer of 2019, we made a significant number of new signings to get ahead of so many players being out of contract. We wanted to get away from these nine guys, eight guys, seven guys being out of contract every year. We did that. Then we added players in January of 2020 as well. You know, we, um, uh, we added Dylan and of course we, we added Ronnie. In the summer of 2020, last summer, we had no first team players out of contract. We had a full wage bill this year. Yet we added players like Johnny Hayes, Tommy Holborn and Greg Lee. Uh, the striker loans last summer were simply due to the injury to Sam. First, of course, we got Ryan Edmondson, who got injured himself for a few weeks, and then Marley Watson, who also got injured in the semi-final of last year's cup with Celtic. Both of these additions were not in our budget, but we made, we made the decision clearly to uh, add resources. In the window that's just passed, we had to get players out before we brought others in because of the lack of income through COVID. Sam was hardly firing on all cylinders, so it was a great piece of business to sell him to Birmingham. But it happened at the end of the window, effectively meaning we, had only, we only had time to bring in uh, loans to provide cover. And good quality loans at that, I might add, um, as, as well. Stephen Glass, so let's talk about this season coming up. Stephen Glass is looking positively at the summer window where he wants to bring in some new players to complement the best experience and the young players we have under contract for next season and beyond. Of course, Scott Brown is his first signing, and make no mistake, Scott can be a big influence with his standing in and knowledge of Scottish football. Yep, absolutely, uh, and that winning mentality as well. With, with so much uncertainty, Dave, about getting fans back and boosting income, uh, Gary McDonald wants to know how this impacts upon squad changes in the summer. Are you planning to reduce the player budget for next season? Uh, and I guess, does European qualification have an impact on that as well? Well, all good, um, all good questions. Obviously, with Stephen just coming on board, We'll work through the plans for next season in the coming weeks. I believe you'll see good signings for next season. In the last financial year that was reported, 2019-20, we spent 9.8 million in wages and Hibernian spent 6.6 .6 million. So at this stage, I don't have a crystal ball on COVID, but I believe we'll be competitive. Okay, well, we're going to talk about club finances uh, now. Uh, Ewan Taylor and William Burnett, thanks for your questions. Uh, they were both keen to find out where the club is placed financially due to the impact of COVID. Dave, at the, at the start of the pandemic, you spoke about a £10 million revenue gap. Can you expand on that? And, uh, and have we received an update on the insurance claim? Yeah, well, I think um, if we bring up the, the, the slide here, we had, I had our finance director, who's a chartered accountant as well, and pull this together rapidly. I think he, he worked overnight so we get prepared. But this is what I call a COVID cash update. So we talked about that 10 million. It ended up being about a 10.4 million gap. What we have to do is uh, take into account as well the operating loss for last season of 2 million. We had planned for a 2 million loss because we had invested ahead of time in building the squad. And again, there was nobody at a contract last summer. So 
Um, we really start off there between those two at 12.4 million. Um, we, uh, we managed and really appreciative to all the staff, the playing staff, etc. cetera, uh, a million pounds of a wage cut. Uh, we got government grants of about 700,000. Uh, myself and my friends put uh, 3.1 million more into the club. Uh, on player trading, uh, before people uh, try and, and, and work out what we got for all the different players and, and who, 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 who we, we, we sold as well, who we sold and who we bought, uh, that net trading number there um, includes, yes, it includes the initial deals for Scott and Sam. It also includes um, what we are selling them, but it also includes the money we're paying we have to pay Rangers 350000 in June for Scott McCrory. But bear this in mind, nobody in paying for players these days pays everything up front in cash. They're typically spread over time. So that is a state of the play for this financial year with the net trading income. Um, I think the question came in was around the government loan and insurance claim. So the government loan and we're really appreciative for it. Uh, at this stage, we draw down two million uh, pounds. Uh, that is a 20 year loan interest free, which is a blessing for us um, at this stage. And we're very appreciative of that. And on our insurance claim, um, that's our estimate. Our estimate's about 2.1 million. We're covered, but um, we haven't had a penny yet. And so we're just, um, we are just um, hoping that Aviva, who are our insurers, um, will start to um, send us money some way uh, soon. But our estimate um, at this stage is that we will get about $2 million for that claim. If that happens, again, it's an estimate. Uh, the net impact um, is of, of, um, uh, with all of that is $200,000. Um, at the bottom there, if, if there are no or part fans until January of 22, the additional impact will be about two million of a hit. So these are the that's the reconciliation there. Okay, a similar question uh, from Stuart Melville, who asks: With the pandemic dragging on uh, and no fans inside Petodre as yet, how long can we survive? Are we in real danger? of having very limited funds to develop and strengthen the squad in the long term. Okay, well, again, I think Chris is going to put up a, a wages to turnover ratio slide. So let's just talk to that. So in 1819, we were almost 16 million. Our payroll costs um, as a percentage of wages, uh, wa uh, turnover was 58% and anything under 60 is healthy. Clearly, last season, we had a few months of hit, 1920, with COVID, and our income went down. Um, our payroll costs were higher at 9.8 million, and so 68% wages to turnover ratio, which is a challenge. Then, of course, this year, uh, 2021, uh, our income is going to be about 10 million, and there's very little and a lot of ways you can do about payroll costs, the vast majority of which are football operation, a football player oriented when everybody's under contract. And that number there includes the million of uh, cuts that everyone agreed to. So we're at 91% uh, wages to turnover for this season. Uh, on the previous slide, we showed how we're coping with the gaps, so the insurance money, the furloughing, all of that stuff has helped us. Unfortunately, you know, if we um, if if we hadn't gone through this, we would have certainly had some money in the bank that we could have put together for things that we want to do, maybe upgrades like a covered pitch at Cormac Park, and um, building up money for the uh, for the new stadium. But the bottom line is, every club is in this situation. Next up, Richard Murray. Um who says that while every club is obviously uh, struggling because of COVID, uh, some teams seem to be attracting better players. Uh, keeping the club afloat is a priority, but playing attractive football will help encourage fans to spend more. Where's the DNA money going, Dave? Okay, well, we've got a, a slide 
um, coming up on that, I believe, as well. Um, and again, I, I maybe didn't fully answer the previous question, will it impact us? It's a great question, who knows? I mean, if someone can tell us that we'll be back playing beginning of the season, right? Um, then, you know, that is a massive help because we'll be back to full crowds and an income. If it's January, then a two, next January, it's a two million hit for us. Yeah, that's a challenge, but it's doable. It goes on much beyond that, then I think everyone will be looking to kind of pair back uh, on, on costs. But look, we're looking at this positively. And, you know, we've got a great team of people at the club managing the club uh, through this, and particularly Kevin McKeever, our finance director, uh, and, and the team there. So moving on to the DNA money, you know, um, you know, you hear things like people saying all of the DNA money went to pay for this player or that player. This is the reality for us. And you know what? We're nothing without fans. So season tickets in our DNA membership is vital for us. We sold about 8,000 season tickets that have ended up being, um, you know, the um, uh, virtual season tickets uh, for this season. And so there's two ways to look at this. If you look at the impact on payroll, right? So 9.1 million will be our wage bill for this year. Season ticket revenue is 2 million. That's 22% of our payroll. So whilst season ticket income is vital, it covers just 22% of our payroll costs. Aber DNA, um, that says gross margin. We take in over a million of our, just over a million on Aber DNA. But once we pay for season ticket discounts, shirts, and all the rest of it, the net amount that uh, is available is 660,000. And what I should say on Aber DNA as well, if you haven't seen recently, is that the retired banking um, executive, Jack Ogston, a big Aberdeen fan, is our first Aber DNA custodian, and Neil Simpson has been um, appointed as an ambassador. Jack and uh, Neil and others as they join in will be the ones looking forward, uh, looking forward to, um, they'll be the ones looking forward um, at how the money is spent. Chris, if we could just put the slide back on, I wanted to mention the operation side. So, so that, so basically season tickets and our DNA covers 29% of our wage bill. If you look at our total operating costs, the costs of running Pataudry, Cormac Park, buses to games, the whole operation is 13.25 million this year. And again, if you look at those numbers there, um, season ticket and our DNA income covers 20% of that, which is why, from my perspective, um, as part of our um, aspirations, our aspirations over the next five years, and maybe I'll take a bit longer, is to go from eight to 9,000 season ticket holders to 15,000, which will be a significant lift and a significant um, investment uh, into the club. Because I can assure you, there is nobody, not one person is taking money out of the club. But that's the perspective of the contribution it makes to payroll and operating costs, Rob. Yeah, some really interesting uh, facts and figures there uh, to try to take in. Um, just wondering, where uh, does it leave the club if there are no games in front of fans until, say, the middle of next season, January 2022? You've touched on it already. Ian, um, who presumably does have a surname but hasn't given it to us, asks what the club's thoughts are on season ticket sales for next season. Well, um, it's a... It's a good question, and um, we've kind of delayed the launch of season tickets till we get more clarity. What I will say is, is that this Don's Live event is the first of many ongoing events. And what I will do is Rob Wicks, our commercial director, and our ticketing people will, in the next few weeks, be coming out with an explanation of what the club is planning to uh, do um, related to season tickets for, uh, for next year. There's a follow-up question from Laura Western as well, um, and, and the answer might be similar, Dave, but she's wondering if there are any plans for discounts on renewals, etc. Yeah, and uh, it's a great question, Laura. I know that your family um, all have season tickets and you're in the one household. Let me give you a couple of data points. Um, 
Of the virtual season tickets we give out to all of the season ticket holders, 85% of those virtual season tickets were activated and used. And many of them we know were shared with other families, which is fine and understandable. Um, as I said you know, a bit earlier, uh, the team is planning to come out with a plan for this season, season tickets um, without stealing any of their thunder. You know, we made a commitment that we would give value, full value to our season ticket holders. That full value is different to different people, you know. And so, but but one of the questions that, that came up a lot of there, I think, was really a, related to, um, you know, keeping, uh, buying one season ticket if it's virtual and keeping seats. That just, as, as I understand it, is a logistical, a major logistical challenge. So let us, give us a few weeks Rob Wicks and the team will come back and they'll do a live event as well. Uh, but if anyone has any concerns about value for the season, just give the season ticket, give the ticket office a call. We have got a tremendous um, uh, support or engagement team um, there to help. Hope you're all getting plenty of out of this um, live with the chairman answering your questions. Uh, Stephen Thompson is asking how successful pay-per-view has been and if there are any plans to keep pay-per-view when the crowds are allowed back in. Well, good questions. Um, the domestic pay-per-view uh, will not be there once full crowds are back. It's simply down to the broadcasting contract with Sky. It would only be international, for example, Red TV. Uh, in terms of the pay-per-view this season, um, if we compare it to the walk-ups that come to games each season, with those walk-ups, we, we generate about a million pounds of, um, of income. The pay-per-view projection for this year is about 300,000. Um, and, and that's pretty good, but compared to walk-ups, it's a 700,000 drop in income from walk-ups uh, to pay-per-view. Okay, for fans uh, willing uh, and who want to help the club financially over the next few months, what are the options available? Uh, Jim Boyle is asking if you'd consider a share issue or debenture scheme uh, as a potential fundraiser um, in the summer. Yeah, again, good question. Um, I think for me, the one thing that... Um, and we're all in this together, right? Nobody's taking money out of the club. We want the club to be successful. Um, I think the one thing fans can do, given the fan engagement, we were engagement initiatives like the Red Shed and the Marquees before the games, is um, I ask our fans to persuade a friend to buy a season ticket and or DNA membership and let us demonstrate with our new fan engagement initiatives that it can be a great day out. Um, regarding the um, uh, share issues, uh, I, personally, I'm not a big fan of debentures because it's all money up front and you've got to, you know, uh, there's not much money kind of down the line with it. Um, but we will absolutely look at a share issue and perhaps a bond issue um, as well, uh, for example. But that will be in conjunction with any new plans for the new stadium. And so that's, we would hold that back until we, um, until we uh, judged what that might take. Talking of the new stadium, Dave, um, in recent weeks, the council have indicated uh, a new stadium project may be possible as part of the regeneration of the beach area. Uh, Kevin Stewart and Chris Forbes would like to know, um, is there any real substance to it? Uh, and why, despite all the planning that went into Kingsford, has this potential rethink come about? Great question. Um, first of all, personally, uh, we have a fantastic natural asset at the beach. Uh, I commend the council for developing Keka, which will be a real asset to the economy when we come out of this. Um, a similar approach to thinking big for the beach renovation is to be applauded as well. Um, but from a club perspective, we welcome Aberdeen City Council's recognition of our, as a club, major role within the community and our contribution to the local economy as evidenced by its proposals for a new stadium to be part of this regeneration of the beach area. Um, as a club, uh, we are keen, along with other stakeholders, to see what part we can play in this. But it's important to stress, Rob, that the site at the beach being proposed 
was not available to us when we sought planning permission for Kingsford. Dave, you, you've been very vocal on, on fan engagement. Um, um, this session, uh, an example of your commitment to being open uh, and transparent with fans. There aren't too many other chairmen or chief executives who are uh, doing much talking at the moment. Cameron Robertson is asking uh, if these types of Q&A sessions, these type of events um, where fans can get their questions answered directly by you, whether they might become a regular thing? Well, yes, and it won't be uh, just me, hopefully not too often, um, but, um, but yes. One thing we've seen through COVID is um, you know, conferences, um, events being held virtually, you know, and, and, and done really well. So um, this Dawn's Live uh, event today will be the first of um, uh, many to come over the next few months and hopefully years um, as well. It's a great medium to get to an awful lot of our fans and it's recorded so they can watch it later. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Rob Wicks and the marketing and um, commercial team will probably be, be up uh, next. Um, as far as uh, me being the only kind of chairman doing this, I made a commitment that we would aim to be transparent and open with our fans, right? And you're kind of damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. You know, if you say too much, you're looking for attention. And if you don't say anything, then you're not being transparent. But so long as the fans see this, of this being of value, how we're communicating, and there's other events to judge uh, as well, we'll do it. Um, on the fan engagement side, um, again, without trying to steal too much thunder, we've talked about this for a while. Um, we want to move to a membership model as a club. So, um, so I feel it's a lot more inclusive. There are things that we can do and people can basically tap into what their budget is. Um, and but in order to do that, we need to have a, a customer relationship management system. And like many other clubs right now, um, our ticketing system doesn't talk to a retail system, doesn't talk to our corporate sales system. We're not the only club, but we've begun a project which by the middle of, I believe, next summer will integrate all of our systems. So we'll have one holistic view of a season ticket holder and their family members, for example. And that will make it much better, much easier for us to tailor the right information at the right time and help us when fans call to be, be able to look at the information being uh, in one place. But uh, you'll begin to see some of this membership model um, approach um, take place with respect to the launch of season tickets uh, that Rob and the team uh, will go through. The match day experience is a massive phrase as far as you're concerned, uh, Dave. I'm just going to throw some questions at you now. A lot of them you've seen in advance, uh, but in the course of the last 45 minutes, we've had other questions being, being fired in as well. So as long as you're happy, uh, we'll throw a few of those at you um, as well. This one comes from Adam P um, on that match day experience. And the question is, what, what is being done to bring excitement at a game? Apart from, of course, well, maybe including what's happening on the pitch. Well, you know, obviously the pitch is on the pitch is critical. Look, there's only so much that we can do with Pitodri, but there's so much we can do at Pitodri to test out things that will work at a new stadium, wherever that is. So, for example, um, there's the red shed right, that we've already trialed and, and will be there. Um, we um, are looking at uh, potential, well, you take the Richard Donald stand, for example, um, you've got um, indoors there. There are things that we can do for fans and families. And even if the children are elsewhere in the stadium, we can get them to their seats 15 minutes before a game. The community trust is gonna be critical in this as a partner of ours. And we shouldn't forget that we in the last few months have signed up over 7,000 Aberdeen, a free Aberdeen under 12 members, primary school children. Uh, they're the fans of the future. 
And there's real tangible benefits like two games a season where they can get vouchers for the games. But we want, um, we want to encourage in these fans. There are things like, and I'm talking out loud here, things like we've got to do in the States where maybe a primary school before a game you know, gets the chance to kind of walk around the track with, the, um, uh, with their primary school team, etc. But when we think, well, first, the other thing as well is we have a new um, catering partner in Baxter Story and the quality, um, the quality of food uh, on offering on match day is a critical piece of this too, not just for the corporate dining, but throughout the stadium as well. And um, we talked about a fan zone, a cricket at the cricket pitch, putting a massive marquee up there for 800 people. We could use the beach ballroom. The beach ballroom could perfectly have be a fan zone before a game. And for those that want to march over before the game, it's not too far a walk, but we can have buses laid on. We could have a family marquee at the back of the Richard Donald stand as well. So these are all the things that from an event perspective that we have planned uh, to look at. And clearly the catalyst for that, Rob's going to be getting fans uh, back. Uh, one other thing as well uh, for me that's important, um, you know, I, I when I was back, but I haven't been home for over a year now um, since um, the, the Motherwell game was cancelled on the 13th of March. But one of the things that's important as well is, is that how we um, greet our fans and be available to help our fans. So between the support or engagement team and perhaps um, you know, university students from Aberdeen and Robert Gordons that um, I would like, we would like to be able to see, um, let's call them ambassadors, greeters, whatever you want to call them, people that are there to help fans. Yes, of course, you need security. We rarely need police uh, at the games, um, which is great. But anyway, these are things I think can make a bit of a, we think can make a bit of a subtle difference to, to what we do. Uh, people have got to feel welcome. They've got to feel like there's an environment there. Obviously, pretoria has got its limitations, but it will give us um, some good experience of what might and might not work for the move to uh, a new stadium. You've, you've spoken already, Dave, about your lack of a crystal ball. Uh, none of us, unfortunately, have one at the moment to know what, what is going to happen in the coming months. Um, do you have a feeling uh, about when there will be at least some fans back inside Pataudry? I mean, obviously, the hope is that there are going to be fans at least at some stadia for the European Championships in June. Whether those will be inside Hamden or not, we, we don't know uh, as yet. But do, do you have a feeling about when there will at least be a limited attendance allowed back inside Pataudry? Well, I'll mention, why don't I mention it, so long as Jason Leach isn't listening to me. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> No, look, I, I, I would be, my view, our view at this stage is that there'll be fans back in some limited capacity, certainly at the beginning of the season, and that into the autumn, um, we would hope it would rapidly move to uh, fuller stadiums. But clearly, if there's a third wave of this, um, that's an issue. One of the reasons why we kind of want to hold off just now on the... Uh, we'd normally by now be launching a season ticket campaign. Um, we won't do that until uh, the end of April, uh, beginning uh, of, of May. But look, I've had the vaccine now, both vaccines. Um, that is a critical piece to this. As I understand it, that um, you know, if, if all senior people, and I guess I include myself in that because I'm over 60, and people that are vulnerable um, have had the vaccine or both vaccines, shots that reduces the risk by 99 percent so uh, here's hoping and praying the next few weeks and couple of months um that um uh, that kind of prediction from myself um it comes true couple more questions to squeeze in dave before we're finished uh, adam corbett uh, has been in touch with us to say what is the real ambition for the club uh, do you think the club can challenge for more than just third place looking forward? Well, you know, um, I, I think you should enter every season looking to win everything, you know? And I think that we've set out a clear strategy on how we want to play. 
you know. And and but listen, especially when you bring in younger players, younger players are going to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. But as a club, you know, we should want, we should be looking to win a, a trophy every few years, if not more. So from my perspective, you know, um, we we as a club have set aspirations. We set an aspiration being a UEFA top 100 club. You get to the group stages of the Conference League or the Europa League, you're there. And, and you know, obviously we've been close a number of times. But remember as well that in order for us to be able to achieve that, part of our goal and aspiration is to increase our season ticket holder base over the next few years to 15,000. It seems like a tall order because historically Aberdeen's never gone above eight to eight and a half thousand season tickets. You know, and you've got a similar size city in Norwich with 26,000 crowds. And so we will do our utmost to make uh, a game day match experience, fan engagement experience, and the product on the pitch to be the best it, it can be. But we can't, I can't do it on my own, right? I'll only do this, we can only do this together, you know? And so, as I said earlier, if fans um, can persuade a friend or another family member to give us a shot for next season, and we can demonstrate that, I think that bodes well, along with these Aberdeen junior members, as they come through the next few years, they'll be the red shed guys in their teams. So our aspirations, are to, are to win games and to win trophies. And a question from Colin Pirrie, which, which follows up on that one, really, and you may have touched on it already, Dave, but uh, Colin is saying, uh, where would you like to see the club in five years' time? Well, I think the question was asked right at the beginning, Rob, um, and um, uh, where do we see the club in five years' time? Um, right, in an ideal world, we're in a new stadium, we have a season ticket holder base of 15,000 and everyone's enjoying the football we're playing and seeing us win trophies every few years, at least. I've saved the best question till last from Stephen Hodds. Uh, do you like butteries and do you get them in America? <laughs> Rowies. I love Rowies. Um, in fact, I, I normally have to take another case back to the States. My grandkids, they call them good morning rolls. My grandkids love them. Uh, I love them too. Uh, everyone likes them differently. Um, I like them um, sliced if they're thick enough and maybe with some bacon in between. Um, but um, since being home for a year now without that, we haven't seen them. Um, but uh, yeah, as a family, uh, we love our rowies. Well, you maybe get your hands on a buttery quite soon then, and I like that. I like that sound of a, a bit of bacon in the middle. If you manage to be able to slice one in without slicing your fingers off in the process, um, Dave. Thanks a lot. Uh, th thanks to all of you for for all of your questions. Some really great questions. Some really searching questions as well. Uh, and hopefully um, you're happy with with the answers you've got from Dave. That, that's it for as, as far as I'm concerned. Hopefully you've got out of it what you've wanted out of it. But I'm going to hand it to you, Dave. Uh, finally. Um, to, to, to give your closing message, basically, to all the fans who are watching in on this live tonight? Sure. Um, look, there's no guarantees in football. My plea is that we're much better together. I'm privileged to be chairman and, in effect, custodian in that role um, for the next few years, however many that is. One thing that's non-negotiable is that the club has to be financially sustainable, um, that doesn't mean to say we can't speculate or invest. Um, COVID has taken away some of that ability to do that because it, it's, it's, it's the money that's gone in has been uh, used for, for losses. But being together through good and bad times is the only way we'll deliver success. We're told by some that one League Cup in 26 years, and I mentioned this before, should be good enough for Aberdeen. Um, yes. It's tough going taking on Celtic and Rangers whose wage bills are 60 to 70 million and ours is 10 million, six times. There's going to be ups and downs, especially when you blood young players. But for me, that's the Aberdeen way. Um, and we're going to have a real go at winning trophies. But we need everybody to pull together and persuade others to come 
and uh, see if they can enjoy not just the match experience, but how the football we play as well. So thank you for your time. Um, we, um, we're going to do this uh, on a regular basis as necessary. And if you guys feel it's of value, um, then we'll continue um, to do this. So thanks for your time.